I'd like to bring to the show Lorenzo Godonio, founder of Lorenzo Godonio Macro Advisors. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. So during the ECB forum on central banking, we've heard from um, the most important central bankers, Bailey, Jerome Powell, and of course, um, Christine Lagarde. So they all hinted that more fiscal, more monetary policy stimulus is about to come. That's for sure. Uh, what do you expect from the ECB specifically um, during the December meeting? Well, I think uh, uh, Christine Lagarde made it clear that something big is coming. So probably at the December meeting, the ECB will announce another package of measures. Uh, my guess is that there will be more uh, asset purchases and there will be more uh, uh, cheap financing, so TLTRO, probably no changes in interest rates. I think changing interest rates is the most controversial move. And uh, I think uh, there is still a chance for that, given that uh, the ECB has introduced uh, a sort of a dual interest rates, so potentially uh, can be lowered even more. Uh, that would not affect dramatically the banking sector, but uh, yet that is uh, a bit of a controversial move. So I think uh, the ECB will focus on uh, asset purchases and uh, more cheap financing for banks. I'm very happy that you brought up the conversation of interest rates specifically when it comes to the ECB. What's the level of negative interest rates that might start to disturb you? Uh, that's a very interesting question. As you know, there is a, a lively debate in academia about the so-called reversal rate. So basically the rate uh, that, uh, uh, you know, after which it becomes uh, uh, counterproductive. Uh, uh, so instead of uh, having easier monetary policy it becomes tighter so I, nobody knows for sure to be quite honest i think uh, given the um, specific uh, uh, dual rates introduced by the ecb there must be more room in my view to cut rates uh, if need be uh, although we are not at that point yet and i think for now the ecb would be happy to continue with more asset purchases maybe some signals in terms of forward guidance. Uh, certainly there is room for some action there as well, uh, but uh, eventually it will be a package of measures. So it won't be just one uh, bit, but a package, uh, a comprehensive package of measures. Right, um, and, and so far, what is your assessment of, of the central bank's um, monetary policy specifically uh, throughout this period of, of pandemic compared to government's answers? Well, I think uh, at the beginning, as you know, there, there has been some, uh, at least, uh, let's say, communication problems by President Lagarde, uh, but uh, it lasted uh, just uh, a few weeks. Uh, I think uh, this time the ECB was very quick and very effective in responding to the crisis compared to 2008, 2009 or 2011 when uh, uh, the Eurozone went through the, uh, the, the sovereign debt crisis. So I think uh, the action by the ECB this time was, first of all, far less controversial because it was well accepted by public opinion and the, um, the governing uh, board of the ECB, but also it was uh, uh, quicker and uh, uh, substantial. So I think uh, this time uh, uh, the, the ECB action has been uh, pretty good, I would say, uh, relative to the past. Now, you can argue that uh, some other jurisdictions, the, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, have been even more proactive. So they've done even more, and, and, and probably they've done uh, uh, in terms of uh, quantity and in terms of uh, speed uh, even more than, than the ECB. That is fair, but you have, we have to acknowledge that the ECB is not yet the central bank of, uh, you know, of, a, of a common uh, uh, of a country, it's a, it's a common area, so there are different sensitivities and uh, it needs to move uh, uh, only when uh, uh, the, the, the governing council is sure uh, that there is enough consensus. And this consensus building usually takes time and uh, um, allows only uh, more gradual moves. Having said that again, uh, this time I think the ECB behaved very well. Right. Um, then at the same time, um, yesterday we've heard um, during um, of the banking, um, you know, of the banking, of the central banking 
um, event um, that Christine Lagarde is particularly proud of the EU answer um, to the pandemic. Of course, she was referring to the recovery fund, but right now we're witnessing a second wave, very strong one um, of coronavirus cases across the European uh, continent. So do you believe this um, recovery fund is going to be enough to respond to this second wave of crisis? Well, the first line of defense is uh, uh, related to national budgets. So, the, as you know, the fiscal rules were suspended and, uh, and uh, governments were allowed to, to spend as much as was needed to counteract uh, the negative impact of the pandemic. I think uh, that was a very good move. Um, uh, indeed, uh, governments, uh, uh, without much coordination, I would say, but they basically took, uh, broadly speaking, the same decision. So income support, uh, support for, support for uh, uh, unemployment schemes uh, and so forth, uh, especially for the um, sectors that were hit uh, hardest. I think uh, um, uh, the second stage would be when uh, uh, the pandemic is over and then you have to rebuild the economy and you have to enhance potential growth over the long term. That is a different phase. And uh, in that in that uh, situation, I think you very much need uh, uh, the support of the um, recovery plan, Next Generation EU, which is a massive plan. And uh, just a few days ago, uh, there was a final compromise between the Council and Parliament, which means that probably it's going to move quickly now. Uh, there is a big problem by, about uh, ratification at national level, but uh, with a little bit of pressure, I think uh, no country would take the responsibility to uh, to reject uh, the package, especially some countries that have been, uh, um, you know, under the spotlight, uh, such as Hungary and Poland, because of the rule of law. I think uh, they they are going to receive a lot of money. So I think uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, the countries will move quickly to ratify uh, the uh, the package, and which means that uh, uh, in late spring next year, it will become fully operational. So I'd like to touch on also uh, Jerome Powell in the United States um, yesterday and not only also during the Fed uh, meeting, um, Powell was criticized many times by journalists that he did not push on Congress to um, launch a second fiscal stimulus uh, package or let's say aid, which was extremely necessary for the United States. What do you think will change from this point of view uh, with, with the upcoming administration, which of course I'm talking about a Biden administration? Yeah, I mean, Powell is very careful. I think uh, uh, clearly um, he is in a difficult position. Uh, um, he's actually managing monetary policy in a situation uh, of uh, change in the administration. And so it's a delicate political moment. Um, he doesn't want to, to uh, kind of uh, send any strong signal to the new administration or the old one. Uh, it is understandable in my view. Nevertheless, it's clear that uh, even in the U.S., uh, most of the action must come from the fiscal side at this stage because there's not much uh, leeway on the monetary side. So I think uh, the new administration will be keen uh, to, uh, to launch a big fiscal package. The problem, in my view, and we don't have uh, yet the final results of the um, presidential elections, if uh, uh, Joe Biden will not have the full support of the Senate, will have to compromise with the Republicans, which probably means that the overall size of the package will be somewhat smaller. Um, but this, we will see that. Uh, I mean, it's not a given. Um, I think Biden uh, is, has a good reputation as a negotiator, and uh, it is well respected also by the moderate part of the Republicans at the Senate. So we will see. I think there is a chance uh, for sure to have a big package. How big it's going to be remains to be seen and it will depend uh, how the final outcome at the Senate will be and how uh, good it will be uh, Joe Biden to negotiate with the opposition at the Senate. Right, certainly it's a very, very interesting story that we're certainly going to follow. But I want to bring you another major story. Dominic Cummings, one of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's most powerful advisors, will leave his position at the heart of Downing Street when Brexit is done at year end after an internal battle over who should be Johnson's chief of staff. 
Uh, I just want to remind everyone that actually Dominic Cummings is the one who uh, masterminded the 2016 Brexit referendum vote and uh, Johnson's 2019 landslide election bid. Um, told the BBC that his position had not changed since January when he said he wanted to be largely uh, redundant by the end of this year. So what do you think will change in regards to the Brexit talks that are supposed to resume in the upcoming week? Uh, well, let's say Dominic Cummings have been, uh, has been a very controversial uh, figure uh, within uh, the UK government. Um, um, he didn't go along very well with the ministers and uh, with the media, and uh, so he was very much, uh, a, a, you know, a controversial uh, figure. So I think, uh, um, you know, the official uh, statement uh, is that he was about to step down anyway. But um, there are some uh, rumors uh, that uh, the, the decision was triggered by leaks on um, coronavirus and the lockdown. Uh, keep in mind that, that that follows also another resignation, which is Lee Kane, the head of communication. So it looks like uh, the vote leave uh, team uh, is actually weakening uh, in, the, in the UK government, which might be a good sign. Um, uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, Boris Johnson is, uh, you know, under enormous pressure since uh, April when uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, spreading uh, uh, became really substantial. Uh, opinion polls uh, suggest uh, that the support for the prime minister is waning, and he is weaker and weaker. He needs to broaden his appeal, and uh, he needs to be uh, less uh, less controversial. Moreover, uh, there is a, a positive uh, uh, silence on uh, the Brexit negotiations which might suggest that uh, they are very close to, to sign the deal. And probably the deal that they are going to sign will not be as uh, uh, as the uh, kind of uh, strict Brexiteers would, would, would suggest, would like to see. And so I think uh, this resignation might also open uh, the way for a different approach towards Brexit. All right, that's very interesting. Thank you so much, Lorenzo Codonio, founder of Lorenzo Codonio Market Advisors. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you.